on page 41, he says, we need to compare the totality picture of Christianity to the totality picture of non-Christian thought. And let me summarize the two basic views that I think he has that are out there. We've talked about the first one, that some people seek abstract universality at the expense of particularity. Let's call that an older rationalist model that's kind of been rejected by our culture. In place of it, there is a quest for absolute particularity, absolute individuality with no broader universal framework in view. The We could call it the triumph of the particular, not just the modern self, the particular modern self, nice. right? To, to, so, so it's the rise and triumph of the particular modern self. Now, those are abstract. In Van Til's day, the absolute idealists knew that. Now, they're, they're not slow. They said, well, we don't want that abstract universal. We don't want that unknowable particular. So what did they do? They saw it in uh, their philosophical worldview, whether it's um, uh, German, American, or British forms of absolute idealism. They sought to bring the universal or eternal the unifying principle, and the particular, the historical, into a mutually developing relationship so that there's nothing in the universal that's not expressed by the particular, and there's nothing expressed by the particular that's not in the universal. They're concrete together. The, the universal and the particular are symbiotically related in a process of development. And Van Til's looking at that and saying, okay, you've got two basic views. One, abstract universal, ultimately says nothing specific. Unknowable particular, because it's so particular, you can't relate it to anything else. That's the abstract uh, problem. The, univ the, the idealist tried to solve that and said, let's bring the universal and particular together in a process of mutual development where both are in a, a process, Van Til says, okay, time out. Let's apply our doctrine of the self-contained God to this question of the universal and particular. And he says this, um, and I believe this is on the top of page 42. He says, the first step and answering the question of the one and many problem will be, and this is just vintage Van Til, this is getting into the new the section on the eternal one and many, is to distinguish between the eternal one and many and the temporal one and many. Yes. And, and that is just a bolt out of the blue for this discussion on universals and particulars, because what the traditional discussion is doing is talking about univer abstract universals, uh, concrete particulars in experience. The idealists are trying to join them together in a symbiotic process with one another. And Van Til's saying, before you get to the temporal unity and diversity, he said, you have to consider this, that quote, unity and diversity form a self-complete unity in the ontological trinity. And so this is going to be the beginning, the first step, in answering the question of the one and many, to make that sharp and categorical distinction between the self-contained trinity on the one side and the temporal order of creation on the other side. And he spends a stunningly an entire section here on unity and diversity within the self-contained ontological trinity that was treated in the previous section. Quite a stunning move, I think. Nice, nice. Okay, so, so, so he's saying that the answer to the dissolution of the old rationalism and the answer to the rise and triumph of the particular self, uh, to borrow from Truman, um, is is the eternal existence of the one and the many in the ontological trinity? Can can we start teasing out some of the distinctive features of the eternal one and many of the one God and three persons? What what are why, why can he say there is an eternal one and, and one and many? What 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 is he interested in preserving in order to uphold this eternal one and many? 
as the solution to the problem of the one and the many? Well, I think the first thing, uh, Carlton, is that he says the persons of the Trinity, I'm going to use my language and then quote him, are exhaustively co-equal with one another. That is, the Son and the Spirit are ontologically on par with the Father. And so this language, uh, which Van Til expands on elsewhere, he expands on this in IS Intro to Systematic Theology, chapter 17, chapters 6, 8, and 9 of the Survey of Christian Epistemology, and a number of other places. His point is this, that the Father subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God. The Son subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God, and the Spirit subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God. Yet there's one God. There are three distinct persons who distinctly are the one living and true God. And so each Trinitarian person is the fullness of the undivided essence of without losing his distinct personal identity. And just to start saying it that way makes you start to think of what? The equal ultimacy of the unity of the essence and the Trinitarian persons who subsist as that undivided essence. And so yeah. um, that the, the first claim that he makes there about the uh, exhaustive co-equality of the Trinitarian persons um, being the one true and living God, that moves us so quickly into the equal ultimacy of unity and diversity, which is one of Van Til's key claims about the, the, the um, reformed philosophy of unity and diversity. It's the philosophical expression of this doctrine of consubstantiality. Sure.